Hello everyone, this is Brother Donnie, Country Homestead Preacher. Hope you're having a great day today. Hope the Lord's been good to you today and his favor has rested on you. Just wanted to come and give you a word this evening about uh, maintaining an attitude of gratitude. And I figure since Thanksgiving is just upon us next week, that it's a great time for us to be reminded how we are to be thankful. You know, folks, it's uh, discouraging to me when you go to the big box stores, Walmarts or Kmarts or uh, other big box stores that oftentimes retailers go directly from Halloween straight to Christmas and just leave Thanksgiving off. Sure, there may be a couple of aisles with a few little things, but really Thanksgiving's not even thought about. Well, I'm going to tell you, for the life of the believer, we are to live with a thank, uh, thankful attitude and a thankful heart because when we realize what Jesus did for us, uh, that puts us at the place to have a thankful heart. So this evening I want us to come from the book of Luke chapter 17. And this is a story no doubt you have heard many times. You've read it in the scriptures. And it's about the ten lepers. And I'm just going to go through and we'll break these scriptures down and give a few uh, thoughts about, about them. In 17 chapter of Luke, verse number 11, the Bible says, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, talking about Jesus, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And verse 12 said, He entered into a certain village. There he met ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voice and, and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priest. And it came about that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he, he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks as he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were, not, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They're not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said to them, Arise, or said to him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, this is very interesting, beloved, because here we see of a man who had a total transformation. And just starting in verse number 11, a few thoughts that we want to pass along. First of all, uh, Jesus was passing through. Uh, he was uh, coming to the place in his ministry. It wasn't going to be very long before he would go to his death. And he was passing through uh, Samaria. Now, you all know, and I'm sure that you've been taught before, that the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. For hundreds of years, they had been at odds. And as a matter of fact, the Samaritans had their own temple. They had their own priest. And they were a, really they were an intermarried group of people, of Jews as well as some uh, Gentiles that had married in and had really created the Samaritans. And for the Jewish mind, the Samaritan was on the same level as a Gentile or as a tax collector. So for Jesus even to be going through this region is phenomenal. So it says, and he entered into a certain village, and there he met ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Now let's uh, talk about this just for a moment here. Uh, biblical leprosy could have been something as minor as a deep skin infection. It could have been uh, deformity of the limbs. It was some sort of nerve disease that affected the nerves. The nerve endings were usually uh, damaged. The people couldn't feel a whole lot of pain. And what made it so so bad was because of the deformity that would take place, they were ostracized. And as a matter of fact, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13 and 14, God had made a way for the lepers, had uh, taught the children of Israel how to deal with lepers, and they were to be separated because the disease was deadly. You know, think of it this way. They didn't have modern medicine back at this time. And what they would have to do is when they thought they were cleansed, first they'd have to be uh, 
found that they had leprosy, the priest would pronounce that. And then when they were cleansed, the priest would also have to pronounce that, that they were clean. Because what they would do, they were ostracized to a separate colony, if you will. They grouped them together in into groups, and the lepers, lepers live, uh, lived together. Now, today in our times, we call leprosy Hansen's disease, and it's still uh, going on in our world. You still see biblical leprosy called Hansen's disease, and as a matter of uh, knowledge, there's about 230,000 cases uh, every single year of Hansen's disease. Now, uh, today it's very treatable. We are under the age of modern medicine, and it is very treatable. However, it's interesting that in our country, in America, in Carville, Louisiana, there was a leper colony at one time to where even in our country, people were put in a certain colony uh, because they had leprosy. But to give you an idea, we see here in 12 that he met 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. You see, the law of God called for their, uh, the lepers to be separated. And the reason God did that, because this disease was so damaging and it's so uh, people died from this disease. There was no cure for it, short of the Lord curing someone. So they would stand afar off and they had to proclaim themselves to be lepers. If anybody come around them, they had to say, leper, leper, stay away. But I want to, I want you to go into the minds of these men just for a moment. Think about these 10 men. We don't know how long they had leprosy. We don't know uh, of, of what form they have. We, we don't know of how, uh, how bad their deformity might have been or anything like that. But we do know that from a psychological standpoint and a physical standpoint, they would have been ostracized. They would have been separated. They would have been snatched away from their families. In other words, beloved, they were desperate. They were at a point of being desperate. So here in 13, we see they lifted their voice, that means they were shouting, and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, no doubt that the fame of Jesus had spread. They knew about Jesus. They had heard that the Jewish Messiah was here, and they wanted mercy. They were desperate in their plea. You know, sometimes in our own life, beloved, just to, to put this little thing in here, in, in our life sometimes, it takes us getting desperate before we'll ever call out to the master. Sometimes we get desperate. Sometimes we get so low that you can't go any lower that you have to turn your eyes up and look at the Lord. So he said, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. Now let's stop right there just a minute. I want you to notice something here. They were not cleansed until they obeyed what Christ said. You see that? Verse number 14. Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. That means that they were not touched from Christ until they obeyed. And it's the same way in our own life, beloved. When you encounter hurdles and challenges, when your faith is tested, when your very being, the fibers of your being is tested, you cannot set on your faith. You have to walk in your faith in order for God to be able to move. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about any Willy Wonka stuff. I'm talking about factual obedience to Christ activates the faith in your life. Now that's not that's not as a name it, claim it type people would say. That's not as the, the charismatic movement would say. That's simply Bible 101. These leopards were not cleansed until they acted on their faith. And you and I is the same way. We can sit here. We can say we have a faith all day long. We can say that God's going to take care of everything. But until we act on our faith, you followed me, I hope. Until we act on our faith, then God will move. Moving on down here. So he said, go, show yourselves to the, or it says, as they came, uh, uh, go show yourselves to the priest. And as it came to pass that they went and they were cleansed. 
You remember I told you a while ago that in order for them to be declared cleansed, they had to go to the priest and Jesus was fulfilling that in the law. He was fulfilling that. Verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice and glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Notice this. This is very interesting. It's pointed out in the scripture here that the one that turned back, the one that fell on his face, the one that glorified Christ, the one that was thankful was a Samaritan. I want you to notice in verse 18, uh, Jesus didn't say anything bad about him being Samaritan. And, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, in 18, he called him a stranger. That would be the same word as a Gentile, a stranger, someone outside the uh, the nation of Israel, someone on the outside. So this Samaritan, he came and he threw himself on Christ and he was thankful. He went against all uh, preset prejudices between the Jews and the Samaritans. He threw all that out the window because in his heart, he was overwhelmed with the joy that Christ had brought him. Because for, for however long this poor man was racked with this leprosy, the overflowing gratitude came back to him and he was thankful to Christ. I want to ask you something, beloved. Do you maintain an, a, a, an attitude of gratitude? Do you walk in the ways of Christ so that you are thankful? I got three reasons quickly why we should maintain an attitude of gratitude. How do we maintain a grateful heart. We see here this man gave everything that he had. He asked for mercy. He said, Lord, uh, we need mercy. And the Lord gave him mercy. Three things here. Number one, in order for us to maintain a grateful heart, we must remember where we were at. We remember where we were at apart from Christ. The book of Ephesians chapter two said that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that he quickened us, right? We were dead in our trespasses. That's where we were at. It also says that we were uh, children of wrath, children of wrath. Beloved, we have to get to the place to where we remember how bad off we were. And then Jesus touched us. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we're saved for a long time. We may be in the faith for years and years. And because we're in the faith for years and years, it's easy for us to forget where Christ has taken us from. How the old man was or the old lady was. We forget where Christ took us from. Number two, we must remember what he did. We must remember what he did. So we remember where we were at, but then we remember what he did. You see, this faith that we have, that we are saved by faith, not by works, so that no man could boast. The faith in Jesus Christ is resting on Jesus Christ, and it's all his work. Now, we responded by faith to the call of salvation, but it's all what he has done. So we remember where we were at. We remember what he did, and we remember where we're going. You know, one day, beloved, this isn't all it is here. This this earth isn't all it is. This life that we're living isn't all it is. And in the book of John, chapter 14, uh, Jesus declared, declared 14, verse 1 through 4. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And where I go, you'll also be. And then, of course, in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, it talks about how uh, at the sound of the trumpet, uh, Christ is going to come and get us one day. Now, let's not fall into argument of when that's going to happen or exactly how it's going to happen. But let me tell you something. It's going to happen. I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, it's uh, whether you're a pre-millennialist or post-millennialist or all millennials. It makes no difference to me what you believe as long as you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and one day you're going to be with him. It'll all be revealed to us one day. So we remember where we were at. We remember what he did, and we remember where we're going. 
And if you and I can do that, we can be like the one that came back to thank Christ. We won't be like the other nine that didn't. The other nine that just kept going will be like the one that lives with a gratitude of thanks, uh, thanksgiving. We will walk with a heart of thankfulness. Because I'm going to tell you, according to the scriptures, his mercy is new every single day. And beloved, in this old world that we have, this sin-wracked hellhole of a planet that we have to live in, we, we are able to sustain because of the grace of the Lord because of his goodness and his mercy that as new as every day sun comes up and he lavishes it on us and we have no business not to be thankful. I hope his words bless you this evening. If I could be encouragement to you, simply send me an email uh, or uh, um, like, like the video, share, subscribe. I would appreciate that. And I hope this again has been encouragement to you. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We'll be back in Colossians probably Tuesday evening and talk about a few more things. But until I talk to you again, this is Brother Donnie, Country Homestead Preacher, and we're changing the world one verse at a time. Good night.